Welcome everybody to our new tutorial on how to record heavy metal drums. And now let's listen in context to the whole track with mastering chain on. I went to Jam House in December 2021 and met incredible bands there. Jam House is a self-funded project with guys who just love to make extreme metal and want a creative space. So they are renting this house and had, it was like a rehearsal room that they slowly transformed into a studio. So I wanted to show them how to record drums and we filmed this process where I showed them like which microphones I'm using, um, how I'm using them, why I'm using them. What you learn today is how to get a good drum sound even in your rehearsal room, in your rehearsal space. Small tip, at first clean it. <laughs> We're gonna mash up two videos here. I've been once in Jam House, then I left for nine months and came back to see what changed. And as a gift I brought the microphone to the guys, the SM57, and we tried the recording technique from Moses Schneider who also worked with bands like Creator and many famous bands in Germany. This mic technique is called the Wurst. And the Wurst is simply awesome and a great way to get a great sound in your room. Moses Schneider have a full book on how to transform your rehearsal room into a record studio. He did it with many famous bands, so Check it out, I will put the link down there. Before we jump into the video, if you are sick of videos like mine, <laughs> in the bad quality, um, there is the Kohle Audio Cult. The cult is near. The Kohle Audio Cult is coming. The most evil academy the world has ever seen. Learn how to record, mix and master Heavier than ever before. Soon it will be time to join. Time to sell your soul to the devil. And this is a new academy where you can learn how to produce heavy metal. Christian is not only an awesome guy and an incredible educator, he's also one of the best metal producers. His sound is just banging and I'm sure you can learn a lot there. There are many guest producers as well, like Cameron Webb, the producer for Motorhead. Bob Mallet, who worked with the greatest. The tutorials in this academy are incredible and they show you step by step how to produce banging heavy metal tracks. If you want to join, you can join for a few months you can just buy the courses that you like, so definitely check it out. You will learn everything from recording to mixing and the mastering process, the production process, and there is an incredible community. So don't miss that. Use my affiliate link down in the description and let's enjoy some heavy metal drum recording techniques here. <laughs> So let's go mic by mic as I'm using it. The first one that I have here is a kick drum. The first we have is, whoa, <laughs> we can take it out now because we are done with the drum recordings and everything. So it's the Lewitt 340 Rex. It's a killer mic, man. <laughs> here we go. Let's have a listen into the individual elements, jump into the mix. So that's the 340 Rex. That's the kick in. There is a button to choose between a low end boost and the mid range boost to get more for the kick. And this was perfect because we had we had metal bands. Everybody was playing metal, but different kinds of metal. So the first band wanted a more old school style. So we put more of the low end there, less of the clickiness. We just used this button. The next band. The low end was way too much because they played a lot with a double bass, so it gets really muddy. So I just take it down and uh, have a way clickier signal. And how I'm pointing it, it's 
it's pointing directly, directly, directly to the uh, beta. So we get this real tick, 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 what is really appreciated in, in, in metal and makes my life easier later in mixing. And actually this bass drum have a really jazzy sound. I don't know what the heck happened here, but it have a really jazzy sound. And, uh, <laughs> and there were different ways to, to mic the kick drum. Yeah, some people, and I did it for a long time, just put it here at the end of the hole. But I'm using this technique only when the hole, hole is smaller, when I have a hole like this or so on, to have more pressure that's coming out. And here, I still wanted some more of the low end. I just put it deeper in and point it directly to the beta. Uh, this is the first kick drum mic. And the second one, now... <laughs> okay, it's funky then. I hope you can follow me here, Andy. Andy is holding the camera, Andy from SIF, who is him also. He was hosting me kindly in his apartment. Thank you, Andy, man. And um, we got one. I can just move it away. Maybe we can see. There is one mic. So we so we we couldn't get the full clickiness out of the sound. So we decided to put a second kick drum mic, the AKG D1112. It's a classic microphone for low end, for the bass drum, for bass guitars. And when you put it like this, you get only the clickiness because it's very close to the beta. It's the kick out. And now with processing, And what you shouldn't forget is to flip the face because the sound will go in two different directions, will be picked up from two different directions. So to make sure you're in phase, flip the face and you're safe here. This is a common technique used and just try it out. It's really cool to have two kick drum mics. For the next we have the snare. And for the snare, usually I got the um, SM57. For the snare drum, we use the Lewitt MTP, and I forget always the name, MTP440. It's a SM57 substitute, um, great on guitars, great on the snare drum. It was the first time I could use it on a snare, and I'm very happy with the results. I don't know if it's a must-have for the snare. I love Lewitt, but if you have a SM57, you are always safe. But I'm really pleased with the results, so we got exactly what we wanted, more of the smack, like a nice balance here. The snare in general is very... It's not so smacky what you know usually from uh, from this metal record. So, the, so we got a lot of body and low end here, but have to work with samples to get more of the attack, more of the snack there. Um, how I'm using it, how I mic the snare, I put two fingers under the rim, that there is like around two fingers space. And I'm most of the time directly above the rim, pointing to the middle, so I have more of the attack. You can imagine like how the sound goes. This is one thing that I can recommend you when you work with microphones, when you when you are recording, to get the feeling how the sound would go through the uh, through the room and through every single element. It's the Im imagination. This is something that I learned from Albert Einstein, what always inspired me to make mind experiments and use your imagination, use your creativity and uh, make common sense with it. Um, on the second, now it, it will be hard, but we have one snare mic under it. I don't take, put much attention to it, like where it's really pointing. Like usually it's pointing to the, it's like this, it's a very cheap one. I'm just using it because it has the clip. It's the only one I have with a clip. This is something that microphone companies could do. Like a cool clip. And it's just pointing to the... Let's turn it around. Look how fat it is. <laughs> it's just pointing here to, to get a little bit more of the rattle, rattle sound. That's the snare. Not a fan of it. Snare top. Lot of kick bleed. Snare bottom.
like a machine gun together with FX. This needs some samples for sure. Kick and snare together. And then here again, flip the face because once the sound goes up and the other sound goes in the other direction, so it will be plus and minus. When you flip the face, they will add up and you get a great sound here. The next one, and I use this only when I have uh, enough inputs, it's the hi-hat mic. Usually it's minus 20 dB in the mix, but it gives a little bit. So if somebody needs more hi-hat, I can just push it up. It's a nice option. I use the second MTP440 that I have. And with the hi-hat, if you want more of the metal, you go more to the middle. Like, uh, or you can just, just move it around and see what you like. Sometimes when they play the open hi-hat and you are here at the edge, you can get some nasty frequencies, some they will phase a little bit. So I try to just stay in the middle and get the clear sound there. Then we have the hi-hat, no processing. With processing. With the rest of the drums. Filling out a little bit more space, I really like it. Um, for the toms, I, I love to show you a beautiful trick for the toms. And I experienced it when I started to record drums, but then I read it also in the book uh, Mixing with Your Mind. It's a very beautiful book and uh, it gives a new view on audio engineering, on mixing, on recording, and have some helpful tips there. And one of the tips is you put your mics here. Oh, yeah, for the mics, we have the Shure. PG-56, sure PG-56, they are from the uh, drum kit set that they are having here and they're cool, I just have the clip here, I can move them up and down and also like I can put them higher, lower, it's very helpful. And what I'm doing, I hold my hand here, how can we start, okay, that you don't think I'm crazy. We have a very sensitive skin at the back of our hand and when you, you can just do the test and go to any low end instrument, you can do it with the kick for example and just feel. You will feel where the most pressure is, where the um, most low end will be. So, and don't tell it to artists. I mean, Andy is now here, but I trust Andy. He knows I'm crazy anyway, so. <laughs> so what I do is, I let somebody play, move my hand. The mic is in the middle of my hand. So exactly where the sensitive part is. When I feel the most pressure, the most low end, I just lock the mic. And that's it, like this I'm sure that I have the most low end out of the toms. So I have to add later less. So I have to add less later. <laughs> the same I do with this one. It's also the sure. And for the toms, we have... Uh, and this was a discovery that I had. Let's get it out of here. Ah, this is my go-to guitar mic. The Sennheiser E609. But it's perfect for toms. Um, about the way how it captures the sound and what I do is I can just move it like this again I put my hand and can feel where is the most low end close to the rim I, I don't want it like in the middle here or whatever I don't want that the drummer hit it I have it under the cymbals so it will cancel out a bit and this is something that I do all the time is to place the mics in the same direction to don't have any phase issues. 
Um, I hope this, this can be helpful for you. <laughs> Get the message, man. Yeah, so this one, just like that, perfect tom mic, versatile, either for electric guitars, uh, even for vocals I used it, and yeah, for the toms, especially for the floor tom I used this. The big toms, you know, often I work with samples and I don't want to say it's not important because I try to get the best sound at the source, but um, this mic is reserved for the floor tom because Especially in these tracks, they made this jungle rhythm, boom, 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 boom. I wanted fat from the source. Then we have the toms, tom one. Tom two. Tom three. All toms together. with processing together with overhead and snare and yeah what we have we work with three overhead mics this time and I always wanted to try them on overheads this was the first time I could do it we have two Lewitt ACT 540S and S stands for sub-zero, means they don't have any self-noise, which is incredible. And they have incredible features here. There is a tutorial on my YouTube channel where, where I test them out and I go through all the features. So there is a tiny computer built in. Everybody goes crazy for them. You, you know, like I, I went crazy when I put the mic and it shined up. And um, there is a volume attenu attenuation because the mics, they have really hot output. And I thought, hey, who the heck needs minus 12 dB? Then I put them here on the overheads and it was peaking all the time. It was like crazy. Uh, my audio interface, the volume was on zero and the input, I, it was by minus 6 dB in my DAW. So it's a lot. And um, I couldn't turn it down anymore because I didn't have a preamp like in between it. So this is a killer feature just press the button here and I choose 0 dB, minus 6 dB or minus, minus 12 dB. And to get a good sound here, I use the minus 12 dB attenuation. The same, here is the equalizer built in. I can cut 80 Hz that I don't need or minus 160 Hz that I usually do on uh, overheads. We got two of them. Uh, there is the second one, NCT 540. So these are my typical left and right microphones that I pan, hard left, hard right. Before I was always panning a little bit, like 78% here, 96% there, and all kind of stuff. Now I just put them left and right, and this allows me to have a wider mix to work in left, right, and center. And sometimes I get crazy, or I put the toms like uh, on, on 40 here, and 60 there, and 90 there, just to have a, a wider field. But most of the things, <coughs> Most of the elements are now panned left, right, center in my mixes. And this makes the mixes wider somehow. Um, and then, because we still had space, I put another, a third overhead mic. And I think I saw it by uh, Christian Kohle, uh, Kohle Keller. Um, lovely greetings to you, man. You have incredible tutorials. And this was really helpful, especially when recording metal drums. Um, I put one overhead in the middle. This is not the final position that we had. We just used it also for the uh, for the vocals. And this is the Lewitt HCT 441 Flex. What a long name, no? <laughs> <laughs> and here I can choose different mic patterns, what is really, really helpful. And we, we just used the typical cardioid. I don't want it to sound from the back, because you can hear it's like a... It's a short, short delay that I don't really want it here. And it was an experimental mic to see what sounds coming in there. And I love the result. It's, it sounds amazing. It gives so much because this too, 
when I put them alone in the mix, it sounds it sounds good. I get the cymbals and so on. But when I put this one to it, it gives like a new element. It really sounds like the full drum kit. Overhead right. Overhead left. Overhead middle. All three together. Together with snare and kick. And overhead with processing alone. Then I use it only for the cymbal sound, kick, snare and overheads. Now it starts to make sense. So if you have space in your audio interface, put the third overhead mic. It really do does uh, magic. Especially we have the small splash here, um, the crash was actually a ride. Because Inea took the Inea took the crash to the <laughs> other studio today, and uh, yeah, like this we have a, a pretty good setup. You know, like the most important is that everything is in phase, um, and to be in phase with those microphones, I show you a little trick that you, if you are watching YouTube, you know this trick, or if you are recording, you know this trick. Um, <coughs> but if you are completely new to drums. I will just share something with you. When you're completely new to drums, um, we try to avoid phase issues. What are phase issues? Sound is moving in a sine wave. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. And um, we want that the elements go all in one direction. Means, let's say you have two microphones. Let's say the snare and the overhead. When both are positive, these waves will add up and add to the sound. Waves that go in opposite directions, they will subtract from each other. Physically, where can we use it physically? In our speakers. Our speakers, when the sine wave is positive, it push out. When the sine wave is negative, it will suck in. So when you have two microphones, one is pushing out, one is sucking in. The speaker will not move 100% forward. This is now... Um, uh, exaggerated, yeah, like let's say it's pushing out like this, it would just push the half. So, when you have every element um, in plus, it will give the full power. So, this is um, the whole philosophy behind it, the whole theory behind it. It's not the philosophy, it's uh, technical. So, to get every element in phase, you can take just the guitar cable or whatever, and they will get one here. In the guitar jungle. Huh. <laughs> Where is it? Sin. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> so what we can do here, take one element, we find one spot, let's say the middle of the snare, just go with the cable to the capsule where the capsule is you keep your finger here you keep exactly the same length and go to the next element and you see because we moved it here what I would have to do now is to put the mic lower so it fits exactly here and this is what we're gonna do This maybe Get forward. That. And back. A little again. Almost. 
and that's the whole magic like this so what's happening now is when you beat the snare and you have the elements left and right the snare sound will arrive at the same time whoop, at the same time in this microphone and in this one so you won't have any problems when mixing let's say this mic is further away you hit the snare the sound is earlier in the right mic but later in the left mic so you can hear some crazy delay and this is something that you really don't want in your mix because it will make your life hell but <laughs> maybe not that bad <laughs> wait i have to change it <laughs> no that's good man yeah 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 that's good man <laughs> it will make your mixing life uh hell <laughs> you, you will you will try to to get all the elements um it will always sound wrong because it's then captured like this, you know, it will be always too late. So you can, you, you will have something wrong, you will have some issues in the sound and you try to equalize it, you try to compress it, but it will never sound the right way because it's not right recorded. You can fix a bit in the mix, but not always. So keep this in mind. We will do the same trick with the middle mic. When you have three overheads, you just go to the same spot. And see, it's almost there. I would have to move it a bit. And that's it. And like this, you get the clean signal um, and some fat drums. So, there is one more mic here in the room that I would like to show you. It's there in the corner. And this is the room mic, it's a tube mic from SE Electronics, uh, the ZE5600A and it captures the sound like one to one, like when you hear the mic on your own you can hear a full drum kit um, with an emphasis on the top, so you hear a lot of splash, cymbals and so on. But I use it more as an effect, especially in metal tracks and what I'm doing is I compress it heavily and just bring it a little bit in to give more consistency, let's say I just put it in the chorus to make the chorus bigger and during the verse this mic is muted. The room mic, ZE1, no processing. And with processing. You can barely hear it, but it's adding a nice dirty character to the drums. Let's listen with and without. Without it. It's like extending the cymbals and adding a little bit more spice to it. And it's gluing this track together, like the drums together to one unit. Um, ah yeah, we got the experimental mic here, and this is a mic from the 70s. This one, it looks super funny. <laughs> it's a Philips made in Austria, and it got a super bright sound, you know, it was made, I think, for moderators to talk, you know, uh, football, to comment some football games and so on. It got a very bright sound and I put it always, sometimes I just put it in between the toms. I think this is the Sylvia Messi style also to get more of the sound here. I used it this time just here in between and you can do crazy stuff with it like. And then the trash mic, it doesn't have any processing. So let's have a listen. All the drums. It's giving this attack that we need for the double bass to cut through. And now with final drum processing on the bus.
we have a decent nice sound here. Additional things I added was a tom reverb, drum parallel compression and a couple of samples. Let's have a listen to the samples. And this is giving the final touches to the drum sound because I didn't like the snare. It was like with a gummy pad or something. And this one gives the ring of the snare to really cut through the track. Let's have a listen to all the drums, including the samples. And now let's listen in context to the whole track with mastering chain on. I think this sounds amazing for a home studio recording. Okay, is back recording? No, I didn't touch anything. Why am I using trash mics? So, so they're called trash mics because maybe you don't use them, you just distort them heavily. There is one story and I will show you a snippet here. When I first time used this microphone, I just put it like under the cymbals a bit. It, it just captured the cymbals. I was mixing the song like it was four years ago, like when I, when I really started. It was a trash metal band from Poland, Vignani. I was mixing the songs like until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. And all the time, in the, like in the sudden, I hear a choir behind me, like a choir in the song. I mute the drums, the choir is gone. This can't be normal, man. This is this is something is I should go sleep. And for one week I was mixing this track and trying new techniques and whatever. Until I figured out the trash mic was the loudest of all. And when the cymbals were hitting, I distorted them, they were pumping, and additional harmonics uh, were added to the track, and they sounded like a choir. We will jump into the project file quickly, like for a minute, and I show you. So you know I'm not crazy. <laughs> And um, <coughs> that's all for the drums. I would just love to show you. And this looks very impressive, but it's not. <laughs> I paid. Um, we got one compressor here. We got one equalizer that is not working. And we got the preamp here with the equalizer section and the compressor. And the only thing I'm using is the compressor to compress minus 1 to minus 3 dB on the snare when it's coming in to have a fatter sound, more consistent sound. And I use the preamp to smash the room mic, get some 350 hertz out of it. 350 or how much am I? Yeah, around 350. It's a very boxy sound. So I'm just getting it out, play a little bit around with the um, gain. Like I'm distorting it slightly and put it in the DAW. So for everybody, this is the first time I'm using it. I just bought it in Austria. We spent 10 days in Austria. We visited Lewitt, made a music video there, a mic review and everything. And I just landed the killer job and always 10%. I was looking 10% from the income. I'm looking for new stuff to upgrade the studio, have some fun, get used to use knobs as well. But it's not crucial to make a good sound. You don't need it. You don't have to go out and buy now a compressor. This compressor was uh, 35 bucks for a stereo compressor. It's really good, the DBX266XL compressor gate. It's just fun to use the knobs, you know. What I like about it, when you're working in the box, you are adjusting the sound with a mouse. You are adjusting button by button by button. But how you can use the compressor in another way is when you use two knobs at the same time to adjust the attack and the release time, for example, you can really hear how it's pumping with the song, how it's uh, working with the song. And you start playing those buttons like an instrument. So if you want to have a little bit more fun, um, 
really it's not crucial and most of the people are in the box. For me it's different. I started in the box and now I want to discover the analog gear and uh, see how it works. Also to be prepared when I go in other studios just to, to get the feeling for it how this works, how the sound really works. Uh, the same with the preamp here. As I said, the equalizer, I bought it, it was cheap, it was 70 bucks. It's a stereo equalizer with I think 30 bands and it's really loud like I clean it. Now it just sometimes uh, stop working and I think this is the other lesson that I learned from the analog gear that this stuff can break and yeah so I, I wasn't using it because I put the attention on the bands to make a uh, good sound and ju just to get the stuff recorded and I will just use the plugins. I love the plugins. We have two interfaces with eight inputs each. They're from two different companies. So what I can do on the Mac, audio MIDI setup. So we have the audio MIDI setup and maybe, maybe people can see this with the camera. There is something called the aggregate device. The aggregate device allows me to virtually connect all the elements together. So I have the focus right and the audio box and my built-in output means they work like one interface, like I would just have one interface. So later in my program, I can just choose, do I want input one to eight from my Scarlet or input one to eight from my audio box, VSL, ADAT, SPDF and yeah, all kinds of stuff. So this is a very helpful feature with a few clicks. I can use them as one unit. And where we go out now, sorry, it's a little bit dirty here because we're at the end of the session. But um, at the end, we're using the Kali audio speakers. And also for new members from the Produce Like a Pro Academy, or if you're a new member, you don't have the big gear or whatever. I started with headphones. And this is where I do most of my mixes. The cool thing with the speakers is when we are sitting together with the band, we are recording, then um, we just press play and you can really feel like this metal track coming into your face. Like, uh, I will just give you an example. So let's, let's say you're recording with the band, everything sounds good. And then like, hey, here, this is your track. You, know, you can have my headphones. Like, some hair from me and stuff like this. It's not so good. <laughs> and um, like this, you can just say, hey, this was a good take, check this out. So when you can feel it better, it's like, it's a different vibe then. Then like this only. <laughs> so yeah, and um, on the other part, I use them now for mixing as well. So what I'm doing is I start the mix with my speakers and see how wide my mixes are, where is everything sitting, the low end part and some details I always do with headphones because I can hear it better. And then when my mix sounds good with the headphones and the speakers, everything is fine for me. So this is awesome what changed here. They are using their Shure mic set and I absolutely love it. And one thing that we are trying here, I brought them like a SM57 as a small gift to try the miking technique from Moses Schneider called the Wurst because it worked awesome on bands like Creator and I thought they can really benefit from it and get the best sound out of their rehearsal room. And the Wurst mic is literally, oh, you can take, give me the camera. So just show you what's going on here. Thank you, Eagle Man. Thank you for this killer performance. <laughs> I will show you the Wurst mic and the Wurst mic, um, it's not only a funny name, we just made it quickly here 
because we didn't thought really about it. It's pointing to the snare. It's close to the drum kit, almost in the same distance. We got it like, like, like this. I don't have my tape measure here. Like this. And um, it's a little bit too close to the, to the toms. Actually, to the floor tom, it's the perfect distance. Uh, to, the, to the second tom, it's the perfect distance. Uh, the floor tom is a little bit too close, but they have two here. <laughs> because one is not enough for this killer music. And what we literally do here is to compress the heck out of it and put it in into the mix. So even with only four microphones, they can have a killer sound here. And yeah, let's check it out how it sounds. So here we go. This is the drum performance from Igli. And what we have is the kick, the snare, two overhead mics and three toms. Tom one, tom two and the floor tom and the Wurst mic. And at first, let's have a listen to this performance without the Wurst. And now with the Wurst. I think the change is amazing. It's like giving all the tone and I think it can save me from a lot of equalization. The way we went in was straight from the microphone into the interface, into the Audi and Evo 16, which have killer preamps. And here, the only thing is face alignment, panning, and that's it. And let's listen to the Wurst on its own without the compressor. I put like a compressor here. Let's listen without. So what you can hear is already all the mid-ranges there that is missing from all the other mics. Let's listen to the mics again alone. So you have all the top end, all the splash, like not all the top end, but uh, at least a lot. And you have all the low end. and now it becomes like a puzzle, just putting in this uh, Wurst mic, still without effect. It's adding all the missing frequencies. Without this microphone, I would have to EQ a lot, either out of the overheads and adjust a lot, maybe from the snare, maybe the kick. And this microphone is like the last frequency that I need, like this last frequency range that is filling up my drums. And now listen what happens when we add the compressor. I had it by minus 20. And listen to how the notes get extended. They get longer and everything is getting more exciting. Let's listen to it in solo. So it's really pumping here and uh, here I'm using the Royal Compressor. Saturation is on 100. Um, this time I don't want it to distort them too heavy. Let's go to the next point. Um, just with the double kick. This sounds nice, but now listen with the Wurst again. Oh, there's all this clicky top end that you need. 
try it out. It's a SM57. They are for around 100 bucks. You can use also a Lewitt MTP440. Just make sure to have the same distance from the snare to the toms and to the kick. And enjoy the ride. And that's something that is really awesome, that I think is really awesome. Uh, they bought a new snare, for example. And it's the Slipknot snare, right? Yep, the JJ one. It sounds awesome. And compared to the one with the, with the uh, gummy pad, this one has a lovely ring to it and it sounds really brutal. So, man, it's perfect. I'm really happy what you guys made here. And the sound is great. We just found like uh, phase issues in the overheads. We just flipped the phase and all the low end came back. So they have to EQ less and have less issues. And um, absolutely happy. A big thing for me is also the smell is gone. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's fucking awesome what you did here, guys.